An understanding of physiology of puberty is absolutely vital before going ahead with different aspects of uh, pathophysiology evaluation and management. The key organs regulating the pubertal onset and progression are the hypothalamus, pituitary and gonads, ovaries and testes. The hypothalamus produces GnRH or the gonadotropin releasing hormone which is the major trigger of puberty and in fact is the increased secretion of GnRH neuron that results in pubertal development which subsequently triggers the production of LH and FSH which then acts on the gonads to produce estradiol in ovaries and testosterone in testes. The hypothalamic pituitary gonadal excess has different levels of activity across childhood. So it is quite active in the fetal period and that is responsible for the fetal growth particularly the development of the male internal and external genitalia. It is also active immediately after birth from around one month of life to three months of life when the levels really go up in what is known as mini puberty and subsequently the HPG axis is largely quiescent and the hormone levels are usually in the undetectable range. So any detectable hormone levels be it LH, FSH, estradiol or testosterone during this phase should be considered significant and a marker of impending or already present puberty. The first chain which starts with puberty is the nocturnal pulses of GnRH which starts triggering and this activity is followed by daytime surges and these pulses really start activating the whole hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Therefore, in the initial phase since there are nocturnal pulses of GnRH and LH, the testosterone production is the maximum in the early morning phase. So therefore, testosterone levels should be measured first thing in the morning and, they, and high levels may be the first marker of early development of puberty. The GnRH neurons along with the olfactory neurons are placed in the olfactory placoid in the fetus and from there they migrate. The migration occurs from GnRH happening to the hypothalamus and from the olfactory placoid to the olfactory bulb under the influence of Cal1 and FGFR1 genes and if there is any defect in terms of this process there may be abnormality of absent GnRH secreting neurons in the hypothalamus resulting in permanent hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and this condition is often associated with a defective migration to the olfactory placoid as well. The condition also results in anosmia which may be a direct pointer to the cause of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in the form of Cal1 and FGFR1 mutations. The regulation of GnRH neurons is largely under the inhibitory control during childhood of GABA and MKRN3. And what is it important to understand that in most situations puberty is actively suppressed and removal of this inhibition is responsible for development of precocious puberty. While the stimulatory process comes largely from glutamate and kiss peptin which acts on the kiss one receptor. Kiss peptin provides a linkage between the nutritional signals and puberty wherein the adipocytes secrete leptin which act on the leptin receptor to stimulate kiss peptin to produce and conduct signals that the body has enough store of adipocytes so as to continue with puberty. Administration of leptin during appropriate ages is associated with development of puberty. Similarly, absence of leptin results in stalled puberty and delayed puberty in most situations. However, administration of leptin in individuals who do not have the appropriate timing for puberty, like a young child does not trigger puberty. So what it means is that leptin is more of a regulator or a gatekeeper in terms of puberty and allows only those individuals who are otherwise fine for puberty to enter puberty if they have enough nutrition because along with growth, puberty and reproduction are the most energy requiring processes in the body and therefore need enough store to be there to begin with. 
Neurokinin B also plays an important role in terms of stimulation of the GnRH neuron. Most situations of precocious puberty are caused by lack of inhibition and this can happen in a number of processes, even milder processes in the form of some infection, irradiation, hydrocephalus infection can really cause uh, abnormality or a sort of a short circuit in the whole wiring and that's where precocious puberty is much more common. So precocious puberty in more situations than not is actually an act of omission in which the active inhibition is just removed while problems in stimulatory pathway result in delayed puberty and this requires an active process. So while precocious puberty can be considered as an act of omission, Delayed puberty is in fact an act of commission in which something has to be grossly wrong in any of these signals may be a large tumor which is interfering with it or some functional defect which will cause these problems. Leptin is gatekeeper of puberty which decides which individuals after having the lack of inhibitors of puberty are fit enough to enter puberty and have enough nutrition. So it provides the physiological basis of linkage of energy stores and one of the more energy intense processes of entering puberty. So the GnRH which is produced by the hypothalamus then acts on the GnRH receptor to activate the coronatrophins LH and FSH. And this LH and FSH are also under regulation of testosterone and estradiol which mainly act on the LH using a feedback inhibition mechanism while FSH is inhibited by inhibin and is activated by activin. The LH and FSH are the two vital gonadotrophins which basically provide diagnostic information about two entirely different things. So while LH is the best marker regarding pubertal onset, FSH is a much better marker with regards to gonadal reserve. Prolactin also plays an important role in inhibiting the secretion of LH and FSH. So therefore, hyperprolactinemia is associated with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. An interesting aspect which often asked is that when we have a single GnRH hormone which acts on both LH and FSH, why do we have different levels of LH and FSH as highlighted by the fact that FSH rises very early in puberty while LH slowly increases. The reason for that is that there is different half-life for different gonadotrophins and there is also differential sensitivities of specific LH and FSH secreting neurons with regards to the action of GnRH. A very important uh, pharmacological role of the GnRH receptor is the use of GnRH agonists which are compounds which stimulate the GnRH receptor. Initial stimulation is associated with increased production of LH and FSH which will cause a flare in the gonadotropin pathway but continuous exposure causes desensitization of the puberty resulting in subsequent inhibition of LH and FSH. So this is a mechanism by which pulsatile GnRH secretion causes a increase in LH FSH level and continuous stimulation causes suppression of LH FSH level and this is used a lot in the treatment of central precocious puberty with the use of GnRH analogs. What is important to emphasize out here is that if there is gap between the action of GnRH analogs, so if the dose is not given in the right time, there would be a recovery of the GnRH uh, if from the effect in causing a production of LH FSH and therefore every time if there is a gap, there would be a potential flare effect of GnRH analogs and therefore it is absolutely important to give the medicine at the exact time when it is recommended. The gonadotrophins in boys, the LH and FSH act on the testis, the LH acting on the LHCG receptor in the Leydig cell causes production of testosterone while FSH acts on the FSH receptor in the Sertoli cells to produce AMH and inhibin B. So in conditions of apparent LH excess like HCG producing tumor or a LHCG receptor mutation or a Macune-Albright syndrome associated increased GnRH action, 
there will be increased activity at the LHCG receptor causing increased production of testosterone and precocious puberty. So these conditions of apparent LH excess will therefore result in precocious puberty in boys. TSH has a structural homology with the FSH receptor. So TSH can bind with FSH receptor when the levels are very very high in the setting of untreated primary hypothyroidism causing increase in testicular size but since it is acting mainly on the Sertoli cells there is no increase as far as the testosterone production so there will be no pubic hair growth or no other features of uh, pubertal development but there would be macro orchidism so hypothyroidism should be suspected in every child who presents with macro orchidism without evidence of puberty the similar effects happen in girls where the LH acts on the LH receptor in the theca cells to produce androstenedione, dione while FSH acts on the FSH receptor in the granulosa cells to activate the aromatase enzyme to produce estradiol. TSH as discussed earlier can bind to the FSH receptor and since in girls binding to the FSH receptor will result in formation of large ovarian cysts there can be estradiol production causing precocious puberty. This form of precocious puberty is characterized by delayed bone age and growth failure. So every girl who has precocious puberty should be tall and should have an advanced bone age. If a girl with precocious puberty is short and has a delayed bone age, hypothyroidism should be suspected. In apparent LH excess states like HCG producing tumor, the HCG will go to the LH receptor. It will work there. But because the aromatase action and estradiol production requires the action of FSH as well, it will not cause precocious puberty in girls. So while hypothyroidism causes precocious puberty in girls and macroarchidism but no precocious puberty in boys, similarly while apparent LH excess states like HCG secreting tumor cause precocious puberty in boys but not in girls. A word about the gonadal development because that is the third major part of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. The development of gonads happens through the urogenital ridge at around 4 to 6 weeks of uh, gestation and there are three organs which are formed, the adrenal which is formed by the NR5A1, kidney formed under the effect of WT1 and finally gonads again which WT1 and NR5A1 play an important role. NR5A1 is in particular involved in not only the development of adrenal gland, the bipotential gonad, but also in testicular development and even pseudogenesis. And therefore, it's an extremely important gene which is expressed in different parts of the entire process of sexual development. The major determinant of male gender is the SRY gene which results along with NR5A1 in the development of testis and the third major gene that comes out here is SOX9 which further causes production of anti-Mullerian hormone causing regression of Mullerian ducts. There are other ovarian genes like FOXL2 and DAX1 which result in development of ovary and there is an ongoing struggle between the anti ovary gene SOX9 and the antitestis gene FOXL2 which decides the fate of the bipotential gonad. The process of testicular development happens under the influence of these three genes the NR5A1, SRY and SOX9 and therefore the, the testis develops into the Sertoli cell under the effect of SOX9 and then it produces AMH and inhibin B the levels of which remain high even in the prepubertal period. So AMH and inhibin B are reliable marker of functional testicular tissue and this may really help in identification of testicular tissue in a situation like anarchia or where there may be either a regression of testis or intra-abdominal testis. So in that situation if the AMH level is detectable one needs to be very cautious in terms of exploration to look for abdominal testis. Ladic cells are largely influenced by the NR5A1 
and while leydig cells do not represent a huge volume of the testes they do result in production of testosterone which causes virilization so in conditions in which there is isolated uh, lh excess in the form of hcg producing tumor lhcg receptor activating mutation or macun albright syndrome you the situation which typically presents is in the form of precocious puberty with only leydig cell enlargement and since leydig cells form only around 15 to 20% of the whole testes the testicular volume is not increased commensurate to the level of pubertal development the other important uh, substance secreted by the leydig cell is the insulin like factor 3 which causes testicular descent the third part of the germ cell also occupy the large volume so in situations of central precocious puberty where both leydig cells and sertoli cells are stimulated the testicular volume is appropriately increased ovarian development happened under the effect of w24 fox cell 2 and dax1 resulting in development of theca cells which produces androstenedione and, dion, and granulosa cell which produces estrogen along with oocyte and there is a the local production of antimuller hormone in the ovaries which has role in different aspects of follicular genesis steroidogenesis is particularly important in the setting of delayed puberty so as has been discussed in detail in the section of congenital adrenal hyperplasia the cholesterol is converted into progesterone under the influence of side chain cleavage star and 3 beta hsd enzymes which play a very important role in the whole pathway this is then converted in the adrenals into cortisol and aldosterone under the 21 and 11 hydroxylase which are further converted into dhas and testosterone which can also be produced in the testes by 17 beta hydroxy dehydrogenase further converted into estradiol under the influence of aromatase in the ovaries so there are defects which will have combined effect of the adrenal gland as well as testis synthesis presenting with xy dsd or even delayed puberty and these include problems in the side chain cleavage star or 3 beta hsd along with problems in the 11 hydroxylase which are associated with increased androgen production <coughs> along with high menlocorticoid action 21 hydroxylase which are associated with decreased menlocorticoid action and increased androgens and 17 hydroxylase which are associated with decreased androgen production and increased menlocorticoid and this is important in different aspects of presentation which will be discussed later on once the androgens are formed the testosterone is converted as discussed earlier via the 5 alpha reductase 2 to dihydrotestosterone which then acts on the androgen receptor and there is also a direct effect of testosterone on the androgen receptor but the affinity of dihydrotestosterone is much higher compared to testosterone and therefore in individuals who have impaired conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone the external genitalia are not fully virilized when the testosterone levels really rise in puberty many folds there may be some virilization which happens in this classical setting of 5 alpha reductase deficiency estrogen acts via the receptors er alpha and er beta largely at the level of breast development bone growth as well as the growth of the uterus so to summarize the hypothalamic pituitary axis in boys is inhibited by the gaba and mkrn3 pathways stimulated by glutamate and kisspeptin results in secretion of gnrh acting on the pituitary to produce lh and fsh which then act on fsh receptor and the lhcg receptor on the sertoli and the leydig cell respectively to produce amh and inhibin d by the sertoli cells and testosterone by the leydig cell testosterone then acts on the 5 alpha reductase 2 to produce dihydrotestosterone which acts on the androgen receptor testosterone can also be aromatized into estrogen so as to act on the estrogen receptor which is responsible for the epiphyseal fusion 
Simultaneously, adrenal also produces a good amount of androgen and conditions associated with increased adrenal action like 21 and 11 hydroxylase deficiency and adrenal carcinoma can present with virilization and these conditions typically are associated with small testis because androgens are being produced outside and testicular volume remains prepubertal. The hypothalamic pituitary girl ac uh, gonadal axis in girls in a nutshell again has the same inhibitory and the stimulatory pathway with a greater role of leptin. The GnRH then acts on the LH which acts on the LH receptor in theca cells to produce androstenedion. FSH acts on the FSH receptor in the granulosa cell to produce aromatase and estradiol. So both LH and FSH are required for the deproduction of the female hormone estradiol while in boys LH alone is good enough. Estradiol acts on the estrogen receptor to cause breast development, epiphyseal maturation and uterine development. The adrenals can also be the source of uh, androgens and they are the major source of androgens in girls and this is associated with development of pubarchy. So isolated pubarchy may be the only manifestation of an adrenal pathology in a girl. TSH as discussed can act on the FSH receptor and prolactin can be acting at the LH FSH production level causing hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Obesity has a very interesting crosstalk with puberty both in girls and boys. In girls in the initial phase when the obesity is there the leptin levels increase and they may actually tell the body that okay now you have enough nutrition to go into puberty. So often there is early puberty in the setting of obesity but when the level of obesity increases more it really causes a dysregulation at the level of pituitary causing a slow puberty. So while obesity pushes puberty early in girls it then ties tends to have a disjuncted form of puberty and this needs to be considered in the evaluation of obese girls who typically present with early onset thylarchy with primary amenorrhea which may be there for quite some time. The situation is a bit different in boys where excessive adiposity results in increased levels of aromatase because aromatase is present in the adipose tissue causing more production of estrogen and this estrogen can then inhibit LH. So usually massive obesity or morbid obesity or great or severe obesity is associated with delayed puberty as in the setting of Pradavili syndrome or other disorders. But characteristically because the adrenal axis, the DHEAS, the pubarchy is triggered, they may have normal pubarchy in this setting. 